Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. Given recent events in the world and economics, I thought it'd be fun to talk a bit about the economics of Age of Empires, and specifically look at the topic of inflation. The concept of inflation is likely familiar to anyone who has had a conversation with an old person. Basically, everything costs way more than it used to, and you had to walk 15 miles uphill both ways to get anywhere. The part about everything costing more is actually true though. Take for example the cost of a cup of coffee. In 1970, they'd go for around 25 cents, and today the average cup is over $1.50. I assume this data doesn't include Starbucks, or it would probably be much higher. The fact is, things just get more expensive over time. Not because things are worth more, but because in most countries, the value of their currency decreases. To take an Age of Empires example, which would you prefer? 150 extra food at the start of the game, or 150 extra food at the one hour mark? I bet most players would agree that 150 at the start is worth much more. So there's intuitively something that at least looks like inflation going on with resources, even if there aren't AOE dollars per se. The obvious explanation is you start with 3 villagers, while ending often with over 100. Compounding that, after every economic upgrade, your villagers are producing more and more per capita, all while consuming nothing. It's really an economist nightmare, where every villager is their own money printer at your empire's federal reserve. Naturally, the cost of everything starts to go up, and we can objectively measure that inflation. Throughout the game, in order to get an equivalent upgrade, you need to pay more over time. You can easily see it in unit upgrade costs, where the long swordsman gives arguably more than the champion upgrade, and it certainly does as a percentage increase, but the champion upgrade costs more than four times as much. Similarly, the crossbow upgrade in Castle Age is less than a third the cost of the Arbalest upgrade, despite giving an objectively better effect. I think the most egregious example though is with the wood upgrades. Not only do the costs increase with each age, but Two Man Saw gives only half the effect of Bow Saw, while costing double. To actually calculate the inflation between each age, let's zero in on the perfect control group. The Archer attack upgrades are unique for giving the exact same effect every age. In that case, the cost jumps average out to 83%. Again, it does the exact same thing every time, but just costs 83% more every age. If we assume the time spent in each age is 12 minutes, which I think is a reasonable estimate for the average player in a realistic game, that gives an average inflation rate of just over 5% per minute. Another way to think of that is the game expects your economy to grow by about 5% per minute during the mid-game, and has matched its costs accordingly. It really emphasizes the need for more town centers and production when you go from your early economy of under 30 villagers into a fully boomed economy of 80 or more when you reach Imperial Age. As your economy expands, it needs to grow at a faster and faster rate in order to keep up. Of course, that is just one technology, which happened to be easy to compare, and if we look at the cost across a broad range of technologies in aggregate, we see about a 6.3% inflation going from feudal to castle age, and about 6.7% from castle to imperial. So what can you do with this information? Honestly, maybe nothing, it's just some stuff I was thinking about. But if I really dig deep to find a takeaway, I think it's not to overstockpile resources unless you're saving up for Imperial Age or some expensive upgrade. Also, keep making villagers until Imperial Age so your economy is expanding to keep up with the tech cost inflation that is already set into the game. But I hear you, isn't gold a hedge against inflation? So just save all of your gold, right? Well, I'd argue stone is the gold in AoE 2. Sorry gold, because it's the resource that's actually limited in supply. Gold can be generated through trade and even relics, whereas there's only a finite amount of stone on the map, and after that your only option is to buy it artificially. I guess the point is, sell all your resources and hoard stone? I don't know, I'm not a financial advisor. But I did read the inflation page on Investopedia to try to see if what's happening in Age of Empires 2 connects with economic theory in the real world. Let's check it out. A popular school of thought is there are three main types of inflation. The first is built-in inflation, which is caused by everybody believing that inflation is going to happen. It sounds circular, and in a way it is. Since workers expect the price of their cup of coffee and everything else to go up, they demand higher wages over time. After all, if the cost of living is going to rise, then the living wage should as well. As wages go up, employers likewise see their expenses go up, so they raise prices to maintain or grow their bottom line. They charge more for that cup of coffee, completing the self-fulfilling prophecy. In Age of Empires, villagers always cost 50 food though, and are happy to work for the same wage, by which I mean no wage, so this type of inflation doesn't really apply. 
The second type is what's called cost push inflation. This happens when production costs increase and that cost is passed along to the consumer. The famous example is in the 1970s when the price of oil went from $3 a barrel to over 30, leading to a large increase in costs for many companies. Similarly, what happens in a one versus one water map when both sides run low on safe wood to chop? Well, the price of wood at the market goes up because the demand is still there, but the remaining wood on the map is expensive to control or impossible to get. Similarly, what happens when the gold supply dwindles to a few relics or contested gold mines on Arabia, but the need for gold remains the same? Well, where you passed up on 100 wood for 100 gold before, you're suddenly okay with selling over 700 wood for that same 100 gold. So while cost push inflation can help explain the extreme swings in the market prices near the end of the game, it's actually the third type of inflation that I'd argue best explains the falling value of resources in a typical game, and that's demand pull inflation. It's sometimes described as too many dollars chasing too few goods. Think hand sanitizer on Amazon these days, which is pulled up by demand, or the inflation that follows an economic boom when everyone feels like they have a lot of money to spend. Demand pull inflation can also occur when there's an increase to the amount of money in circulation. Instead of dollars on Amazon chasing a diminishing number of goods, this is way too many dollars chasing the same number of goods. There are lots of historical examples of this, like in Spain due to the influx of gold and silver taken from the New World, Germany's hyperinflation following World War I, when the price of a loaf of bread went from 160 to 200 billion marks in just one year as a result of overprinting money. Or the more recent example of Zimbabwe's hyperinflation in the late 2000s, culminating in the printing of a $100 trillion bill. Before it became a hot collector's item, if you were to try to exchange that for US dollars, it would be worth about 40 cents. This is what I think explains why the Lithuanian's 150 extra food at the start of the game is much better than if it was 150 food at one hour. Essentially, the resources are flowing in like printing free money, so it makes sense that things would start to cost more. Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that inflation is a bad thing, but that's not necessarily the case. First of all, it promotes spending because hiding your money under the mattress for years means it would lose value, so you're incentivized to not save. Money that you spend is someone else's income, so encouraging people to spend in general is great for an economy. It also encourages borrowing. If you had borrowed $100 from someone in 1920, it would have the buying power of almost 1300 of today's US dollars. So paying back the original 100 is only giving the lender, or more likely their descendants, something worth about 8% of its original value. Good deal. Something else I wanna quickly touch on is the related idea of deflation. As you probably know or can guess, that's the opposite, where money buys you more tomorrow than it does today. The militia line as you go up to champion is a good example of what I'll call technological deflation. While they might cost the same to create, you get something better later than you did earlier. This is similar to how $1,000 can buy you a much better computer than you could have gotten a few years ago. And tracking that back to the 1940s, you can see the cost of computing power equal to an iPad would have been in the trillions of dollars. It's an example of where technology can, in a bubble, have deflationary characteristics though the overall trend in Age of Empires remains inflation. So that was all a bit of intro level economics applied to Age of Empires. Special thanks to this video's sponsor, Karambitcoin. In the next episode, maybe we'll dive into the systemic issues surrounding Age of Empires housing bubble. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.